It was October 2020. I'm a 17-year-old girl, but was 16 at the time of this story. I was walking into my local skate park with a friend, let's call her Chloe, to sit down at the gazebo so we could hang out, when a man, let's call him Michael, approached us with concha and coke and asked if he could eat his bread there. A concha is a Mexican sweet bread, which is basically just bread with some cookie dough crumble on it. Chloe and I tried to ignore him when he sat down next to us, but it was extremely hard when he started to make conversation. Michael offered Chloe and I cigarettes, and I declined, but Chloe accepted, which I was fairly irritated with her for, as that basically gave him an opening to start chatting to us. Michael sat crisscrossed next to us and started rambling on and on about how he had crystal meth and how he wanted to smoke it, but he didn't have a pipe. He asked us if we did, and we obviously told him no. Then he proceeded to pull out a baggie filled with what I can only assume was meth and offered it to us. I began to get a bad feeling in my stomach at that point as we both declined his offer and he put it away, lighting up a cigarette instead. He talked nonsense for the next 30 minutes that Chloe and I were sitting there for, going on about how he was Michael Jackson and we were his Lisa's. Lisa 1 and Lisa 2, he called us. He didn't once ask us for our names. He just made them up. He said he was a musician and that he was going to make it big once he got off the streets. Chloe and I looked at each other and I gave her the look that I wanted to leave. She got the hint, so I told Michael it was time for me to go home and that I needed to be back by dinner time or I'd be in trouble. He looked at us with an angry expression and said, Okay, can I get a hug? Chloe told him no, but before I could even respond, he grabbed me and pulled me into a tight bear hug, kissing the side of my face. Chloe just stood there and said nothing, and did nothing. Michael released me after I attempted to push him off, and I had tears in my eyes. Then I got up, and before I could even start walking, he grabbed my hand and asked if we wanted to hang out again. Chloe and I sped walked away, and thank God my best friend Evan lived about five minute walk from there. Chloe and I got out of Michael's view and bolted for Evan's house. I got up to his room and immediately fell into his arms, crying my eyes out. I didn't tell my mum until later that week, when I saw the man again when we were grabbing dinner downtown. I started to have a panic attack, and when we got into the car I told her everything that had happened. Michael kissing my face, me trying to get away with Chloe, and even going to Evan's house after the incident. We filed a police report afterwards, and even after a year, my case has yet to be closed. Michael is currently residing in a mental hospital, so they can evaluate his condition off of meth, and see if he actually is capable of going to court, or if he is too mentally unstable to get charged with anything. I hope someone sees this story and doesn't make the same mistake I did. Don't let people take advantage of you. A little bit of backstory. I went to Miami earlier this year. Didn't know a lot of people there, but I still went. I was 20 at the time and not really jacked, but I know how to hold myself. I got there on a Saturday and I knew that weekend nights at the beach are where the fun things happen. Night eventually rolled around and I took an Uber to South Beach. I walked around for about an hour and a half and found a bench to sit down at to check my phone. As I'm sitting down minding my own business, a person walks up to me and sits on the same bench as me. I didn't think much of it. The place was packed being that it's a weekend night. A few minutes pass by and he starts up a conversation with me. I will refer to him as dude. He seemed like a chilled person around the same age as me, average build. I'm usually really good at reading vibes, and I didn't get any negative vibes from him. I tell him that I'm new here, that I had arrived in Miami and that I didn't really know anyone here. That was probably my first mistake. My phone had started to die, and I also needed to use the restroom, 
but the bars and restaurants there won't let you use the restroom unless you are a customer. So I was shit out of luck. The dude told me that he has a place not far away from here and offered to let me come over to use the restroom and charge my stuff for a few minutes. Looking back now, I should have declined the offer. But I did take him up on the offer. We get to his place, and as soon as I enter, I got really odd vibes. His house was just giving off negative energy, but I don't want to pay it any attention. He tells me where I can plug my stuff in and shows me the way to the bathroom. So after using the bathroom, I walked back into the living room and sat down. My plan was to let my stuff charge for 15 to 20 minutes, then leave. The dude sits down beside me, and we actually had a pretty good conversation at first. He just seemed like a chill person who was trying to be nice. About five minutes after he sat down beside me, that's when things took a turn. He gets up, walks to the kitchen and pours two glasses of vodka, walks back to me and hands me one. I didn't want to come off as rude, so I took the glass and just held it. I wasn't trying to get drunk, especially around someone I just met. After he realized I wasn't drinking, he kept on trying to get me to drink. He kept saying stuff like, Come on, I just want to help you relax some. I told him I didn't want to drink, and he got visibly upset. He started saying stuff like, I let you into my house and you can't take a shot with me? At this point, my gut was telling me to get the fuck out of there. I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure his intentions weren't as pure as I had originally thought. As I was trying to figure out a way to leave without upsetting him, he starts to compliment my looks. As someone who was sexually assaulted two years ago, my fight or flight response was kicking in. I got up and acted like I was looking for my wallet in my backpack. I acted like I couldn't find it and that I probably left it at the beach. I said that I was going to walk back to the beach and that I would return when I found my wallet. And no, I definitely didn't plan on returning. I packed my stuff and as I was doing so, the dude started laughing. It was such a demonic laugh, I'll never be able to get it out of my head. I bolted out of the door and get to the sidewalk and start walking away. I'm not even off the block yet and I hear his door open back up. The dude starts speed walking towards me as if he was following me, while he was still laughing demonically. My first thought was, okay, well, this is a serial killer. I'm about to be killed. I started to run. I don't know exactly how far I ran, but it was at least five blocks. Once I knew he wasn't following me anymore, I spent $10 on an Uber to get me far away from the area. The night was still young and I knew the nightlife would still be active on the beach. So I went back to the beach, just about 10 miles away from my original location, just to make sure if he went back there looking for me, that he wouldn't find me. To the dude who was trying to push himself on me, screw you. In the summer of 2006, I was offered a place to study history at Bangar University in North Wales. It wasn't my first choice of uni, but I always wanted to move away for university. I mean, that's half the point of the whole thing, isn't it? See, new places meet new people, expand and enrich your intellect and all that. Bangor wasn't exactly Manchester or Birmingham, but there was something very quaint about having such a relatively prestigious university built into such a small and story town. In the end, I only lived in Bangor for the better part of a year, as I ended up dropping out due to family problems. But my brief time there yielded a variety of different experiences. Some I'll always remember, and some I wish I could forget. So much like most other students at that age, university bred a desire for well experimentation. And as I partook in a few puffs of the wise man's mint, as one of my mates called it, and decided that yeah, it was something I was going to get into. I didn't take the drinking all that much, too much puking, 
and the hangovers just weren't worth it. But smoking up in a circle packed with intelligent, thoughtful people, that was a different kettle of fish entirely. All right, most of the stuff we talked about was just absolute nonsense, which prompted nothing but a descent into giggles. But it was fun. And on top of that, you weren't a soulless, dehydrated husk the next morning. So one morning, I get talking to this local lad called Ricky. Ricky had grown up in Bangor, and but wasn't academic enough for university. However, that didn't stop him from walking up into the student areas to take advantage of the public price pubs, which is how I got to talking to him. Eventually, the conversation got on to smoke and where I could get my hands on some. But local dealers didn't always trust the students, and even when they did, the chances that they just rip you off. Assuming you were spending mommy and daddy's money was very high indeed, which is why Ricky's promise of I'll get some for you was like music to my ears. I took his number down, told him I'd give him the text sometime, then finished up my pint, lost my game of pool, then wandered back to Halls. The next day, I gave Ricky a text, and we arranged to meet outside a block of flats on the other side of town. This seemed a bit risky, as it was in the lower portion of Bangor, where the locals lived, and not up on the hill where most of the lecture rooms and halls were. But Ricky seemed like a nice enough bloke. I considered myself fairly streetwise, and with me having no other connections, I figured, why not? So I went to meet him, gave him my last 20 quid, and stood outside the flats well, and we went out to ring one of the buzzers. Now, I'm not completely soft, so I actually ended up peering over my shoulder to get a peek of which one he's ringing, just in case anything goes awry. The door opens. He says, back in a minute, and walks inside. A minute goes by, no sign of Rookie. Two minutes go by, still no sign of Ricky. After 15 minutes of standing outside those flats like an absolute plant pot, I tried calling him, but as you can probably guess, he didn't answer his phone. I dropped him a few texts like WTF is going on in here, and again, I get no replies. Obviously, I'm absolutely furious thinking, I can't believe I'm actually getting mugged off here, and there's absolutely no effing chance that I'm about to just walk away without kicking off. So I marched up to the little keypad near the front door of the flats and started buzzing the same button Ricky pushed. Hello? Some voice buzzes over the intercom. Yeah, I'm a mate of Ricky's. He's got something that's mine. He needs to get back. Oh. The fellow on the other end was obviously playing dumb. Look mate, I've just seen him go into your flat, so you can either let me in or I'll come back later with my cousins and we can see what happens. It was a pure bluff. My cousins were like 60 miles away, but it worked. There was a brief silence and then the door buzzed open. I walked right up the stairs to flat three knock on the door, and someone instantly answers it aloud about my age, who's keeping the door closed over because Ricky is evidently hiding inside. Mate, I know Ricky is here, and he's got something in mind. So he was here, yeah, the lad cuts me off, but he's just gone off the back, said he'll be back in a few minutes. Then I hear a voice that obviously belongs to someone older, saying, let him wait inside if he wants. The lad looks off to the right, then opens up the door. I walk in to see about three or four guys, again about my age, and one older balding bloke are down to his shoulders with this big, thick stash. In front of him on this dirty wooden coffee table, almost every kind of illegal substance you can imagine. And after waiting there for about 15 minutes, tension rising the whole time, I decided to give them something of an ultimatum. Because there is absolutely no doubt that I am getting scammed, and they just so happened to be in on it. Now, 
I know, I know, what I did next was just stupid. The please don't underestimate how angry I was and how I just refused to swallow my pride and walk away. So he turned to the old bloke and say something like, look man, let's just work this out. Ricky got 20 quid of mine and I'm not stupid. I know what the crack is. I'm also not walking away without it. So let's just say you give me an eighth of that green there and that way I don't have to file a police report saying some lad robbed me and ran into this flat. You get me? Big mistake. Massive mistake. Sometimes it really is just better to swallow your pride and walk away, especially if the only other option is throwing around threats that you're unlikely to back up. But in the heat of the moment, that's kind of what I did. And by kind of mo, you'll see what I mean in a minute. Until hearing my police threat, the older bloke just sort of nods his up to save fair shout and gets up and walks over to the front door. I'm thinking, hang on, what's he doing? And when he locks the front door to the flat with a mortised lock and slides the key into his pocket, I just think, oh, you can imagine what came next. The three younger lads jumped me. I tried my best to fight back, but as you can probably guess, three on one didn't give me a chance to throw so much as two or three solid punches. Before I was on the deck getting the absolute life kicked out of me, all to a soundtrack of you coming to my flat and threatening me. Not happening. But the worst part was when I just heard, grab his hand, kept them still. I'm still in the middle of struggling, but I managed to get just a glimpse of the old bloke with a dumbbell in his hand might know what's coming. This fellow is going to smash my hand the bits without weight and I'm probably never going to be able to write or type properly again. Thankfully, he didn't go through a smash in my hand up. Instead, he does this faint thing right as I think he's going to do it, then laughs his head off when I let out this embarrassingly girly scream. After that, I'm quite literally thrown out of the flat, and as I manage to bring myself to my feet and look back, to see that one of the lads has my bloody provisional driver's license in hand. The wallet must have fallen out of the swipe during the kicking. Ah oh well, now we know your name and where you live. Go the filth and you're a dead man. Get lost. I wandered. But the story doesn't end there. It just gets much weirder and arguably more terrifying. If I'd had just walked away with a bit of a bruised ego, I'd have saved myself a good kicking. However, in actually laying hands on me, these lads had made a huge mistake. I wasn't some gangster bound to a code of silence and honesty. Neither were they. I was a big city, and I definitely wasn't scared of some small town dealers. And if they thought they could just intimidate some kid into silence that were dead wrong, because the first place I go, after I ended up getting kicked out of the Phyllis flat, is the Bangor police station. I was just dead honest with them. I told them I got scammed trying to buy smoke. Told the man been battered with me thinking the whole time. They're going to go round up this bloke's flat, and they're going to know he's got drugs in there. The place stunk of them, and that's how I'm going to get my own back. Solid plan right? And quick side note, for anyone who says I'm a coward, a grass, or a snitch for going to the police, wind your neck in Tony Montana. This isn't the wire. This is real life, and you fight with anything you've got available to you. Only, it didn't quite turn out like that. I was hoping the police would knock round Nick the bloke and his underlings, and then I'd see massive drug busts in the papers for a week or something like that. But when the police got back in touch, they said they'd nick a lad for assaulting me, but he was going to plead guilty, so it didn't look like I'd have to go to court or anything. They gave me some leaflets on getting over trauma, advised me to file victims of crime compensation claim, and then that was that. Yeah, it was some small measure of revenge, 
but it wasn't quite the complete and utter takedown I'd been hoping for. That being said, it would turn out that I didn't have to lift a finger to get my own back on Ricky. His own people would do that for me. Not even seven days later, I'm doing a bit of food shopping down at Morrison's, when who should I see? The giant cast on his leg and bruises all over his face. But Ricky, of all people, almost everyone I spoke to about it was like, wow, that's some karma in action right there. And they might still be right. It might have been a complete coincidence that one week the lad robs me, and the next he's in a bloody thigh cast, which how I know it must have been a really bad break. Stranger things have happened, right? But there's a thing. I don't really believe in coincidences. I believe in cause and effect. I think the top dog down in the lower town flat was just that top dog in the area. And I think the trouble Ricky ended up causing him Mende was only a fanny hair away from being nicked for selling class A's. I think he was so angry that he had his little minions break Ricky's leg. I mean, how else to explain his black eyes and all that? He slipped and fell on the path of an oncoming fun run, pulled the other one. But then, the thing that really tickled me, the thing that honestly made my blood run cold was this. If they were willing to do that to one of their own, they wouldn't bat an eyelid at the idea of doing the same to some other idiot student, would they? And it's only then that I realized how bloody lucky I'd really been. A few months after I completely balls up my end of year exams, ended up dropping out. And that was the end of that chapter. Needless to say, despite the relatively short amount of time I'd spent there, Bangor really did teach me a thing or two. They just turned out not quite to be the kind of things I imagined when I arrived. This is an experience my wife and I just had this past year. As soon as the quarantine was lifted in our area, she and I filled our packs and went for a hike at our local state park. It was something we used to do pretty regularly and have since before we got married. Speaking for myself, I was looking forward to it. The plan was to hike out to a certain lake, spend the night, and hike back to the car. It was a clear, warm day, and the trails were nice and dry. For most of that morning, we had been the only people on the trail. We decided to stop for lunch at a campsite about halfway to the lake. Another couple must have had the same idea. They were sitting at the concrete picnic table, and we asked to join them. Soon, the four of us were discussing what we had seen and where we were headed. The couple turned out to be newlyweds on their honeymoon. My wife, who's a hopeless romantic, loves to hear this. She proceeded to tell them how we met and some other sappy stuff I don't bother to remember. Two hours passed and we finally said our goodbyes. We arrived at the lake about an hour before dark, tired and hungry. I got a fire started and Mandy, my wife, cooked us a small meal while I pitched the tent. We sat around the fire cooking s'mores and eventually called it a night around 10 p.m. I got up just before dawn the next morning and got the fire ready to make breakfast. We repeated our rolls from the night prior, except I pulled the tent down and repacked it. Then measures were taken to assure the fire was completely out after cooking. And with that, we took to the trail for the return journey. At 10 a.m., we reached the halfway point but chose not to stop. Two hours of the trail, we ran into the couple we met the day before. Strangely, his wife wasn't with him. Mandy asked him about her location, and the man said she'd become ill the night before and returned home. When he said it, he looked nervous and couldn't look either of us in our eyes before either of us could ask anything else. He said that his wife had insisted he finish the trip alone. It sounded a bit strange, but we had no reason not to believe him. A group of people came walking up about that same time, and the husband excused themselves to talk to them. I wasn't interested in prying any further. Their marriage was none of my business. I thought Mandy looked like she wanted to stay, but I reminded her of the obligations we had that night. She reluctantly agreed, and we went on our way. 
We got to the parking lot not too long after and packed up our stuff. There were a few groups of people talking amongst themselves. As we pulled out of the lot, several more cars, including a ranger's truck, were pulling in. Once again, I thought nothing of it. We made the news. We made it back home that afternoon and handled some family things. It wasn't until breakfast that we heard the news. I grabbed a cup of coffee and sat down in front of the TV. I flipped it on just in time to receive a report of a dead female camper. When they showed her face on the screen, I almost choked on my coffee. It was a picture of the woman we had met just two days prior. I yelled out to Mandy to join me in the living room. I wanted to be sure of what I was seeing. I didn't have my glasses on at the time, so I pointed at the TV and asked, Isn't that one of the newlyweds we met at the park? She watched for a moment and let out a shocked gasp. Just then, a wedding photo of a couple appeared on the screen. Mandy grabs the remote from my hand and turns up the volume. According to the husband, the couple had been at a cliffside that was a popular lookout. Mandy and I had been there once or twice ourselves in the past. They watched the sun rise, and as they were preparing to turn and leave, the wife lost her footing and fell several hundred feet to the ground below. It was certainly possible, but something bothered me about it. Why hadn't he mentioned this to us? More so, what was up with the illness story? It couldn't have been more than a few hours after the incident occurred. None of his behavior made any sense. I know if something had happened to me, I'd have been a mess. We passed at least 15 people that morning and not a soul talked to us. It all seemed fishy to me. I was glad to see that Mandy agreed with me. It looked as if her instincts had been right once again. Just don't tell her I said that. After a long discussion about our responsibilities in the light, we agreed that we should contact the law enforcement involved in the case. And as it stood, the husband isn't under any suspicion. Not publicly, anyway. I contacted the sheriff's office and told them what we knew. The deputy put us on hold for a moment, and when we returned, he said someone may reach out to us in the future. But it's been almost a year, and no one has contacted us. This is what brings me to email you here. What do you think? My instincts and my wife tell us that a crime may have occurred. We, however, have no proof or any real justification for our feelings. And that's just what they are. Feelings. Certainly, if law enforcement believed we had something to offer, they would have already contacted us, right? I don't want to be a nuisance, nor do I want to cause trouble for a grieving man who by all appearances is a decent person. But help me out here. Should I keep pushing or leave the police to do their jobs? I just can't shake this nagging feeling that a man is getting away with cold-blooded murder.